Hello everyone, I'm Ron and welcome to Popsicle, where we talk about popular culture, science, and everything in between. Welcome to the first episode and thank you for coming. For this first episode, we'll be talking about biology of science fiction, but in particular, we'll be focusing on a very important part of science and something that I will argue is also a very, very important part of science fiction, and that's evolutionary biology. What I want to impress upon you in this particular episode is that evolution is a framework for understanding science fiction in general, particularly how humans move around in science fiction texts, what defines humanity in certain science fiction texts that's governed by evolutionary biology rules. To be able to understand that, first let's begin with what science fiction is. Of course, those of you who are fans of science fiction would have some sort of an idea, although some of you may be thinking of some examples of science fiction that are not necessarily considered to be science fiction by everyone, including some science fiction authors and experts. For example, as much as I wouldn't want to start the debate here, uh, Star Wars is still one of those properties that is still being that are being debated upon as whether as to whether it's science fiction or not there are some proponents on either side that's not something that we we'll really get into although i will mention that one of our primary references doesn't necessarily consider star wars to be real science fiction at least by the definition that he gives so what is science fiction it's part of an umbrella term or, or umbrella genre called the speculative fiction genre, although that's somewhat new in terms of the development of literary genres. But because it's speculative, we can say that there's a lot of, you know, fiction and creativity and imagination and fantastical elements being put into it. Although, of course, it's important to recognize that science fiction is a different genre from fantasy and from horror superhero fiction, although there are a lot of overlaps. Uh, perhaps not between science fiction and fantasy, not so much, except for those uh, texts like Final Fantasy, the video series of video games, which are mostly fantastical in terms of how they portray the use of magic, but has certain science fiction elements like this, uh, uh, steam engine technology or steampunk technology, I should say. Science fiction and horror have enjoyed a lot more connivances over the years. And you can see this with uh, prime examples like Frankenstein, Alien, The Thing, and several other classics of both genres. But it's very important to be able to distinguish science fiction from these other genres. First of all, we can say that science fiction is really more grounded in reality. That's really one of the things that distinguishes it from fantasy, which relies on, as the name suggests, fantastical elements like magic. Fantasy and horror both rely on supernatural elements, those that cannot really be explained by science at the moment. And so they lose their grounding in terms of reality compared to science fiction, which, while extending the reality with imagination of the author, is still based on science. Now, there are two main figures that we have to talk about when discussing the overall definition or history of science fiction. One is Darko Suvin, who is a Slav-born uh, philosopher and historian in science fiction. Uh, he was based in McGill University in Canada. And he defines science fiction as that genre which talks about the novum or the new or a strange newness. In particular, he says that this strange newness or novum, in plural form nova, introduces readers to cognitive estrangement. So what is this cognitive estrangement? Essentially, it's uh, the idea that humans can change from their current state. We can overcome our current state. This is very sci-fi if you think about it, thinking about examples like transhumanism, for instance being able to change the trajectory of human speciation through technology. That's something very related to the idea of cognitive estrangement. It's a new way of thinking which challenges the status quo. A good example of this would be the classic science fiction film Metropolis, 
which finds us uh, a companion piece to The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, both of which talk about the struggles between laborers and capitalists and uh, that struggle eventually leading to a revolution. Of course, that's only hinted at in The Time Machine, but it's very explicit in Fritz Lang's classic, brilliant science fiction epic, Metropolis. So it's this strange newness that we see in biological text as aliens that are very distinct from humans, hybrids that violate normal laws of reproduction as far as we can understand them from Earth biology, aberrations, mutants that have uh, very distinct capabilities that we have not seen yet in real life on Earth, and others. These are the biological tropes, these are the biological nova that are highlighted by science fiction that use biology as centerpiece. For example, those that talk about cloning and genetically modified organisms and transhumanism. The second author that we would like to talk about is James Egan. No, not this guy, but this guy. So not the director of Guardians of the Galaxy, but the founding director of the Center for the Study of Science Fiction in the University of Kansas. He's also a science fiction author. In fact, he was chosen by the science fiction and fantasy writers of America as one of their grand masters, which is one of the biggest titles that a science fiction author could have. So what does James Egan say about science fiction? He says that science fiction as a genre is like science itself, something that assumes that the world, that the universe is knowable and understandable by the human mind. If we look at this definition of science and science fiction per James Egan, this would explain why the cosmic horror of H.P. Lovecraft is very frightening because it tells you that there are many things in the universe that we will go mad from if we try to understand them. But again, the assumption of science is that the universe is knowable. And so this is one of the groundings that science fiction has that the other speculative fiction genres don't have. Like fantasy and horror relying on the supernatural, which by definition cannot be currently explained by science. Science explains natural phenomena. James Egan also compares science fiction to naturalism. Okay? Uh, by saying that it's a sort of naturalism that is fantastic. Naturalism is a genre which situates its characters, particularly its human characters, in nature. Humans being a product of nature. But of course, science fiction would take it to a more fictional, to a more imaginative side or angle. But that's the important core of science fiction. It situates humans in nature. Just as nature changes, humans will change. And that's actually consistent with the idea by Darko Suvin about the cognitive estrangement, that humans can change. And aside from humans changing with the environment, the other primary element in James Egan's definition of science fiction is that humans know about that change, about the, 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 the way that the environment is changing and that we can change with the environment and thus look forward to a future. In fact, many biologists believe that this is one of the things that truly really sets humans apart from other animal species. We have a concept of the future and working toward the future to be able to change our destiny or our future. This gives humans power in science fiction. And this really is what I want to focus on in this particular episode in the context of the Red Queen Hypothesis. So in case you were wondering why the title of this episode is Cosmic Red Queen, that's because it relies on this particular uh, idea by the evolutionary biologist uh, Lee Van Valen, uh, who said that as the environment is changing, so are other species. And what is the implication of this? Evolution is not so simple in that organisms or populations of species change to become better than all the rest. That's not really how evolution works. According to the Red Queen hypothesis, organisms evolve just to be able to survive and not to have reproductive success or higher fitness than others. It's not to be better 
but just to be able to survive. Why? Because species are playing catch up to other species and the environment itself, which is also changing. Now, why is this called the Red Queen Hypothesis? It's based on the Red Queen, the character from Lewis Carroll's books on Alice, Alice Through the Looking Glass, Alice in Wonderland. There's a quote there from the Red Queen that says, and I quote, Now, here you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. Unquote. It sounds silly. It sounds uh, absurd, which a lot of the content of Lewis Carroll's Alice books are like, but evolutionary biologists like Van Valen have co-opted this particular idea to talk about the fact that as organisms are changing, other organisms are also changing alongside them, and so is the environment. So it's just plain catch up. Humans are the same. Just like other species that we share this world with, we are plain catch up. Many evolutionary biologists, in fact, believe that the organisms around us that affect us, like pathogens and parasites, are evolving at much faster rates than we are. And so in terms of the Red Queen hypothesis and its complementary idea, the evolutionary arms race, we are not quite up to par and we might be losing that race. We have to catch up much more efficiently. What is called the evolutionary arms race is what it sounds like. It's a race of weapons okay, to outcompete other species in a constantly changing environment. And the, con the concept that it uses or the framework that it uses is evolutionary biology. If you look at the common biological tropes in science fiction like genetics and biotechnology, cloning, bizarre reproduction, parasites and pathogens, alien biodiversity, it's all about evolution. Just as evolution is the framework for biological thought, it can be considered to be the framework for biological science fiction. For example, why are so many alien species existing in science fiction worlds like Star Trek and, let's say, Star Wars? That's because of evolution. Evolution leading to changes in populations that accumulate over time, eventually possibly leading to diversification through speciation or the formation of new species. We have pathogens and parasites, like I mentioned earlier, being in a constant evolutionary arms race with their hosts. Genetics and biotechnology would probably allow us to be able to cast ourselves into a future state that is very different from our own right now. For example, CRISPR-Cas9 technology allows us to tweak our genetic material. Of course, this is done on non-germline cells or meaning uh, somatic cells, those that are not passed on to the next generation. But germline editing, even now, is being discussed in the context of CRISPR-Cas9. And of course, when you manipulate the germline, that will potentially be passed on to the next generation. And heritability is one of the major components of evolution. For a trait to be subject to evolution, it has to be heritable. But it's not only in science fiction that utilizes biological tropes or NOVA where we can see that evolution plays an important role in providing the thematic framework. The way that human societies work within their social setting in science fiction texts speaks about how evolution affects us as a species and how it brings us into a particular trajectory in the future. Whether it's the cosmic diaspora of the human species like in Frank Herbert's Dune or Isaac Asimov's The Foundation novels, or humans evolving into many different species like in Olaf Stapledon's novels, or humans being pressured by evolutionary forces in outer space and thus becoming potentially new species like the new types in the Gundam Universal Century uh, timeline, or apotheosis like in 2001 A Space Odyssey and Neon Genesis Evangelion, evolution can take the human species in a very different and unique direction. And understanding evolution and how it works can give us a much better appreciation of these science fiction texts, particularly if we want to predict where the human species will go. 
many biologists believe that there are two ways by which Homo sapiens can become a completely different species. And those are transhumanism, using technology to be able to manipulate our genetic material and the trajectory of our species, and cosmic diaspora, or going out into outer space and being subjected to evolutionary pressures that our species has, has never been exposed to. And I've mentioned several good examples of that. The Expanse is another one, uh, which shows how living on Mars changes the human anatomy. So the bottom line in this particular episode that I'd like to say is that just as evolution is central to biology, it is also central to humanity's role in science fiction texts. So what the great evolutionary biologist Theodosius Dobshansky said before, which is, and I quote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, unquote, makes sense also in science fiction as a framework for helping us understand how humanity moves around in this genre, but also how we share this universe with so many diverse species and forms. So that's episode one of Popsicle, the Cosmic Red Queen. Hopefully you enjoyed it and learned quite a bit from it in terms of science fiction and the role of biology in it. So if you like what you just watched, don't forget to subscribe down below and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!